Uh, hi, uh, welcome. It's June 5th, mm -hmm. 2019, and um, welcome to the Library of Congress. We've just had a wonderful talk on Black Lives Matter and music, mm -hmm. and I'd like to welcome uh, Fernando Arruela, uh, Allison Martin, and Stephanie Shonekin. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for being here. And we just wanted to follow up that very good Botkin lecture with learning a little bit about you and your careers as scholars, mm -hmm. and perhaps what you're working on now. So um, who'd like to start? Stephanie, start since you're closest. OK. Um, so um, I'm Stephanie Shanikan. I am um, chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at the, the University of Massachusetts. Um, I've been there just for one year. Before this, I was at the University of Missouri. And before that, I was at Columbia College in, in Chicago. And before that, I was, I was in, in grad school in, in Indiana, which is where I met Fernando. Um, and um, is that all you need to, to know? Well, for and this you're part? an ethnomusicologist. I'm an ethnomusicologist, <laughs> yes. And you, were, and you and Fernando met at Indiana's in, right. Department of oh, Folklore, Folklore and Ethnomusicology. At that time, it was Department of Folklore. But, but it has since become the Department of Folklore and right. Ethnomusicology. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and so um, we had different um, paths. Um, we were all trained in folklore, but so, and some of us also um, specialized in ethnomusicology, which is what I did. Um, and then I have a minor in African American studies. Okay. And oh. Allison? Yes, I'm Allie Martin. I'm a PhD candidate at Indiana uh, in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. I'm on the ethnomusicology side. Um, I'm still very early in my career, as I'm still in grad school. Um, but I, I started as a, a classically trained violinist um, at American University. And then I took a class on the musical worlds of DC, um, in which I quickly realized that if I did not study go-go music in this class about DC music, that no one was going to. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was my first time doing a project on DC. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just fell into it from there. And are you from DC originally? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland, which is right outside of the city, um, east of the city. I grew up in Largo, um, and I lived in Bowie for a long time. Mm -hmm. And how about you? My name is Fernando Rojola, and I started in the folklore program and then discovered ethnomusicology while I was a graduate student. But I proudly wear both hats, folklorist and ethnomusicologist. And I finished my graduate program and rolled into a position as senior lecturer at Indiana University, where I teach courses mostly in the ethnomusicology program. Um, and then, of course, like Stephanie said, that's where I met her. And uh, mm -hmm. we were probably brought together by some faculty mm -hmm. members in particular, Ronald Smith, who's an ethnomusicologist, and Dr. Portia Maltby, who's also an ethnomusicologist. Mm -hmm. And we kind of have those ties for all three of us, and that we are part of a particular uh, community of, mm -hmm. of ethnomusicologists at IU. Mm -hmm. who do and and when music. did you two first meet? I got in 96. Six, 90, yeah, I got there in 96. And I got there in 94. And did you start off as a musician? Uh, actually, I did. I studied classical piano for most of my childhood. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and where did you grow up? At Cincinnati, Ohio. And I studied at the conservatory there at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and then <laughs> money ran out, so I stopped, <laughs> stopped playing. Um, but discovered, I guess, folklore first. I was an English and classics major. And I took a folklore class and discovered that uh, I could study people who look like me and you know, play music like me and do things that are not classical, mm -hmm. but treated as art. So that was my first discovery into the disciplines. And how about you? Were you a musician? No, not at all. Um, I was, um, I had gotten a master's, so all my, uh, my undergrad and my, um, my master's degrees are from uh, universities in Nigeria. And um, my, my master's was, my thesis was the study of um, African American poetry and music. So I looked at Langston Hughes and um, Louis Armstrong and Miles Davis and, and um, Amiri Baraka, right? But, and but you grew up in Nigeria? I grew up, I grew up in, in Nigeria. Um, first few years in, in Trinidad, which is where, where my mother is from. And then um, later on in, in Nigeria. So um, during my master's, I became really intrigued by the, um, the ways in which um, black people expressed them, themselves. Because 
um, myself, I was, I, was, I was black, but I was from two different parts of the black world. Um, and so, I, so, so that really fascinated me, um, looking at the Caribbean, looking at West Africa, but also looking at African American music and, and culture. And so I, so, the, so I got my master's in English, but with that focus, and, and then from, from, where from the University of Ibadan, which is, in my mind, one of the best in, in, <laughs> in Nigeria, if not the best. And then um, um, a professor of, of mine from Nigeria had come to a uh, folklore conference and actually met Ruth Stone at the conference. Ruth, and Ruth, Ruth Stone, Stone, yes. Yes, yes. and Ruth Stone, um, he learned from her about eth the field of ethnomusicology. Um, and so he, he, he contacted me and said, I found the field for you. <laughs> Had you ever been to the States before? Yes, I had. I had, been, I had been to the States, but I had no idea about ethnomusicology um, until um, my, 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 my professor, who was a folklorist, his name was Isidore Okpehu, who um, studied African folklore. Um, and so he, he put me onto it, and I applied and, and got in. So um, I'm very grateful for that meeting between Okpehu and Ruth Stone. So you, you all met mm -hmm. in Indiana? Yes. Well, Ali is, um, Alison She's a is current a student Fernando right student. Yeah. yeah, so the co-chairs of my dissertation are actually Ruth Stone and Fernando. So. That's interesting. It is. It is. It's a small little <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about this book. Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and Music, which Indiana uh, mm -hmm. University Press, Press mm -hmm. just put out last year. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what led you to think about writing this? It happened progressively. Uh -huh. In the SEM annual meeting, Stephanie put together a panel mm -hmm. for us to talk about Black Lives Matter and music. And it actually evolved into certain things that were happening at that particular moment mm -hmm. for both of us and the other panelists. What, what year was that? Uh, that was 2015, mm -hmm. so that was the year really when it started kind of uh, mm -hmm. gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. And then since that was more of a, a roundtable discussion, we got together and said, let's do this at the American Folklore Society meeting and write papers about what we kind of mm -hmm. fleshed out in, mm -hmm. in, in a roundtable. And Ali participated at that talk, Langston, um, who was uh, about to lecture earlier. Wilkins. Mm -hmm. Langston Wilkins, mm -hmm. um, also an IU graduate. Um, in our program, participated in that paper session. Mm -hmm. And then we were approached by Indiana University immediately, and mm -hmm. they wanted to do that book in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about teaching African American culture at a university level and what the challenges are, the rewards? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm currently the chair of a, an, a department um, that actually is called the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies, and we're really proud of, of that that title, that name, and that's because at <coughs> University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, yes, Anne because Amherst. of course Du Bois is from um, Massachusetts, and he's a proud son, and we're proud to be named after him. Um, but it, it it reminds us that this field is old, right? It's an old mm -hmm. field. It's a field that goes back to um, the late 1800s. Um, when great minds were, were thinking about um, the knowledge that was being produced by the experiences of African Americans in this, in, in, in this, in this country. So I think, I think of it as a very important field. I think it's a field that, um, you know, I get questions all the time from well-meaning um, folks about, oh, you know, um, why don't you just, um, study music in a school of, of, of music or in a department of music? Why do you have to have an African-American studies department? And, I, and my response is, is always, you know, if I could trust that the schools of music or the English de department or the art department would include in the curriculum black, um, black artists, um, black composers, black writers, um, from anywhere in the black world, then we wouldn't need an, a, a department like this. But, but we're not there yet, right? We, we do need to have a, a, a space that, where we prioritize the works of, of people of, of color, black folks in particular, um, um, 
from the US and around the world. So it's, it's a field that is, is incredibly important for all of us, you know, as, as much as I love to see black students in, in my classes, I think it's, it's important for other students to be in those classes too, because black history is American history, right? Um, so um, I think at this turn, um, we're in 2019 now, more and more of these departments are sort of um, widening their, their scope to include um, what's now called Africana studies, not just African American, but Africa and the diaspora. And I think it's really important to um, remind ourselves of the, of the historical connections, um, but also the, the nuances between what happened in Africa with colonialism and what happened in the Americas with slavery. Um, and what happened in, in places like the West Indies, which is part of the, the Americas with both colonialism and slavery, right? And what the impact of that is on, on the people. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good field. Um, it's an important field um, and it needs to be con continually supported by the academy. How about you? You've just started teaching, right? Yes, I don't have as much teaching experience as, as anyone used to. Um, but I really um, relied on and enjoyed the visibility of being a black woman teaching black studies and teaching ethnomusicology. Because when I was an undergrad, I had one black woman professor, and it was for a gen ed class. So it was kind of happenstance that it even mm -hmm. happened. And one of the reasons that it came to Indiana specifically was because in ethnomusicology at Indiana, you have people like Portia Mosby and Melanie Burnham and now Alicia Jones and all of these people. And I wanted to be in, you know, in conversation with them. And so one of the things I do in my classes when we're talking about systemic racism and, you know, these kinds of things is I'll be like, raise your hand if you've had two or more black women instructors in, you know, in your college career. And maybe one or two people will put their hand up. And I'll say, well, you know, okay, put your hand up if you've had one or more, you know. And then I'll say, put your hand down if it's me. <laughs> and then there's not, there's not many hands up mm -hmm. because they just, you know, for some of them, I'm the only black woman that they will have mm. as a professor. And I'm a graduate student. Mm. And so I really um, sort of lean on that kind of visibility because it's really important to see someone like me, you know, as, as a teacher in this, mm -hmm. in this space. Mm. Well, for me, my experience is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to what I teach in particular, especially with, with black popular music, um, actually, um, it came up a little bit in the conversation um, at the, after, the, after the discussion, or after the, the talks, about talking about black music to students who are interested, or consumers of it, and for hip hop in particular, since 1992, 72 to 75% of the consumption has been by a white population. So it can be, it is this generation's popular music, mm -hmm. and not having a connection to why you do the sounds that you make, or why you say the things that you do, why you rhyme the way you rhyme, you know, those kind of disconnections are just not part of what culture studies is about African American and African music making is all about. And so it is more than just being a subculturist and attaching yourselves because you are connected to the scene because it's on trend. But it's probably, for me, more important to understand that this is rooted in cultural manifestations of what West African music making is all about in comparison to what you might have learned in the music department of what European music um, theory is all about. And so to diversify the ways in which we think about music Think about art, think about literature, culture, as being part of a global system of meanings as opposed to just isolating it to the Europeanists that we get in our traditional classes. Um, as an English major and a classics major, you know, so for me, um, even at, taking an American, this is back in the 80s, mm -hmm. taking an American lit course, a survey of American literature course, I didn't have a single author who was a person of color. And that's 1980s. So I mean, we did have a lot of black authors that we could have used. We could have mm -hmm. Latino authors that we could have used. We could have Asian authors that we could have used to talk about the American experience. Um, but that that was exactly right. That is exactly why we do need departments of, of minority studies, mm -hmm. uh, minorities in this country, because that can still happen. Mm -hmm. 
in education today. Do you think things are getting better, more diverse, or staying the same? Or? A little bit. I would say yes, um, but I also am confronted with those people who have to teach mm -hmm. these kind of courses, this kind of literature. Uh -huh. I wrote a, um, a, a kind of a handbook on the history of, of rap music and hip hop culture, and it is targeting you know, music school folks who are required now, not by choice, but required to teach a popular music course, mm -hmm. especially rap music, because that will bring it students. What's the title? Uh, rap music and hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the book that I, I put together, but it is meant for uh, an audience of teachers who are more required to teach it, mm -hmm. don't really have the investment in the culture, but not recognize the fact that to diversify the scope of music in a music school, they need to teach classes like this. Do you find that um, your students, uh, especially white students who love rap music, are interested or aware of, of its origins or the cultural connections? In my experience, and you guys can chime in too, uh, they usually are a little bit more shocked when they come into the classroom after they've been in for a while. It's like, oh, I, this is not what I thought this class was going to be about. I thought we were just going to talk about Jay-Z and the songs, you know, my favorite mm -hmm. songs, basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, music appreciation kind it, it, of. Like a, e an easy credit mm -hmm. for. An easy uh, credit, yeah. but also fun, because yeah. this, is my, this is the music that I listen to and not recognize the fact that when I say toasting, toasting the DJ in that tradition in the uh -huh. live components of the 1970s, it has a history that goes back to storytelling in African-American 1800s, maybe even 1700s mm -hmm. tradition of celebrating an outlaw type figure, a person who's, who's bold enough to stand up against anyone. And it's like, okay, and that kind of follows through even in re reversioning itself in gangster rappers or hardcore rappers, um, personas and, and narratives. I think there's often a, a pushback from students to who um, view this music as simply beat, you know, like it's, it's just a beat, it's a good beat, you don't have to make a big statement out of everything that you teach, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and so it's, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's important to remind them that um, actually this music has a, a really strong message that you should listen for as well. Um, yeah, sure, enjoy the, the beat, but also listen to what's, what's, um, what these, these young these young artists have to say about the world that they're living in, whether you're listening to Snoop Dogg or um, Kendrick, right? Um, Compton is a place that most of you who buy this music will never go to, um, have never been to, and um, you need to listen to what they have to say about the community that they grew up in. Um, so I think recently, I just saw this on, on social media, Yo-Yo Ma um, said something about um, music and art has never been for art's sake, that it, that it, it should do, do more. And so um, one of my colleagues in the School of, of Music was, was just thrilled and um, excited about that, that message to which I kind of <laughs> rolled my eyes and said, well, we've been saying this, you know, um, those of us who, who study African-American music have been saying, um, within schools of, of, of music, have been saying that we need to get our students to, to really think about, even if it's, it's jazz, about what, what, it, what does it mean that jazz is from New Orleans or from St. Louis or Kansas City? What, mm -hmm. what are these artists, um, how, how is the sound of the jazz and the structure of the jazz different in, in these three places or four places or whatever? Um, and what does that say about the ways in which people live in, in those places? Um, and how can we better understand the diversity of black life, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the music is always, has always been about um, um, doing more than just giving you a sonic entertainment, right? Um, and sometimes I think, back to, back to, your, to your question, Nancy, I think um, often students um, kind of push back on that and are, are startled that um, this is actually a serious field of, of, of study. You know, I always tell them that the music that we are listening to in this class should be taken as seriously as a Shakespeare play, right? Um, and I want you to listen to it with as much intent and um, intentionality 
as um, as you would a, a text in one of your STEM classes, you know, and um, and and it takes a little prodding, but but they come they come around to it. One of the one of the things you made me think about mm -hmm. it when you said arts for arts sake. One of the things I do in my classes on the first or second, you know, class meeting is to talk about tattoos mm -hmm. and ask anyone if they have tattoos or tattoo okay. ideas that they would like to share. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes you'll get a ton of people talk and I mean they talk about and they love to talk about that, right? And they're talking about <laughs> grief and you mm -hmm. know, people mm -hmm. that they've loved and places that they love and you know, all these really intense things and then I'll talk about mine. Um, and, and then we get into this conversation about how art is not for art's sake because mm -hmm. here's this art that we wear in our bodies and it's really important to us. So immediately we're like, that's awesome. We're, yeah. you, you know, we're mm -hmm. doing this thing here. So you see it to get into uh, culture and art and mm -hmm. meaning. And yeah. meaning, yes, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because I mean, symbols. they have really, um, you know, in-depth stories about family and friends and place. And, you mm -hmm. know. That's a great way to get into it. Mm -hmm. And also ways of uh, talking about, or approaching it and say like insider, outsider information, because may see your wrist. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, this may be important to some folks mm -hmm. and know what, exactly what that means, and then yeah. others uh -huh. might not have a clue what that means. It's like, that's an interesting scribble. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we, you know, they're always like, oh, are you going to talk about yours? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'll talk about mine. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about yours first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So what, what are you working on now? What's next for mm -hmm. you? So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm working on um, three different things. Um, one, of course, is the class I talked about in the lecture, um, Race and the American Story. My colleague Adam and I are working Adam. on Adam C. Grave. And where is Adam? He's, he's at Arizona State University, and mm -hmm. he's a political science um, scholar. Um, and then, so he and I are working on that project and the students gave us so much rich information and they've given us the permission to, to publish it. Just for this interview, could you reiterate sure. what you, mm -hmm. the description of the class? Yes, yes. It's a, the name of the class is Race and the American Story and we created this at Mizzou. Um, uh, which is University of University of Missouri. Missouri um, uh, because Adam and I both taught there at the time and we were both um, sort of... Um, we, we wanted to challenge ourselves to figure out a way to get beyond the hashtags and to get beyond the little tweets that were coming out from and, and every angle. And this was angle. a very tense time at University yes, of Yes, it was, so. it was. So we, we created this course, opened it up to, it was a one credit course. We had um, um, texts from the Declaration of Independence all the way to the Obama race speech and, um, and, and students were taken on this journey and it, the classes, we, we had five sections, they all filled. Um, so we knew there was a hunger for um, more of an engagement in this, in this kind of discourse. Um, so we taught it then and then when we both moved, he moved to Arizona State, I moved to, to Massachusetts, we decided to continue teaching it knowing that we would have very different students in these, in these two, two states. And um, we, we brought them to a uh, symposium in April in Arizona. We brought them all, to, all together in a room for a whole day. So you were um, simultaneously teaching, teaching it throughout the semester? Yes, and then and, and we had the same syllabus. Uh -huh. And then we came together. And so the, so the students were um, really fascinated by each other's points of, of reference and points of, you know, um, their, their own worldviews from different worlds, really, in the United States. Um, and so, uh, so Adam and I are working on that project. We're, we're going to um, continue it. So that's one. The second thing I'm working on right now is um, the Max Roach album, um, We Insist. I'm, doing, I'm working on a project, a, a book that, ki that kind of um, frames that album as a really important album to Africana studies. And then lastly, I'm working on a project with a, co with a friend, a colleague, um, on, on the notion of skin bleaching in, in Africa and thinking about the psychological effects of colonialism um, that is manifested in women bleaching their skin to get lighter. So it's three very different yeah. <laughs> projects, but it keeps me on my toes for sure. <laughs> And how about, how about you, Ali? What's next for you? So, dissertation. Right? <laughs> dissertation. And the topic of your dissertation is? Yes. Yeah, so my, my main focus right now is finishing my dissertation. 
Um, a dissertation is tentatively entitled uh, Sonic Intersections, Listening to Gentrification in Washington, D.C. Um, and so when I listen to gentrification, I'm thinking about a number of different things that could be displaced in the go-go music that I was talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, I also have done a lot of work with soundscapes and thinking about you know the environment um, and how gentrification has really shifted the soundscapes of these, of these neighborhoods. Um, some of this is about legislation, so things like the Amplified Noise Act um, in D.C. Uh, so all of these things sort of coming together and how we listen to them um, in, in D.C. specifically. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a, a member of your committee here, so I will just assume that it's going very well. It's You're just going very well. Done. I think it's going well. But, but I'm sure it's going, going well. at a very fast but, pace. I'm actually telling her to slow down. Do, do you see your, your future as a, a, a teaching at a... At, in higher education, or? Well, I mean, you know, the job market is the job market, so we'll <laughs> see what happens. I like, I like to do a lot of different things. I really, really enjoy teaching, and I enjoy any time I get the chance to teach, be it a guest lecture somewhere or a full class. But I also spent a year as a fellow at the Smithsonian at the Anacostia Community Museum, um, and I really enjoyed, you know, any kind of curatorship um, and that kind of work. Um, and I also think that the work that I'm doing specifically uh, is useful for the public. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that has happened to me in, you know, in the time that I've been in grad school is that some things I, I knew, but I didn't have the language for. And so where I knew things about GoGo -Go, you know, five, six years ago, I didn't have a language of the criminalization of black sound. Um, and so I'm trying to think of ways that my work can be useful to give people language to talk about things that they already know. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, you know, aren't legible mm -hmm. to, you know, the bodies that they need to be legible to. So um, I'm open to a lot of different things, you know. I'm looking. Just putting it out there. Just putting it out there, <laughs> you know. Uh, but we'll see. You'll find something. And how about you? For me, uh, well, I just completed two projects. Uh, well, but I started my program as a graduate student. I only intended on stopping at the master's and working in museums. So I had an opportunity to work with two museums projects. One was at the Carnegie Hall as a music specialist for the hip hop section. At Carnegie Hall, at Carnegie in, New Hall in New York. And Portia Molesby's um, were working from a framework that she had created as far as uh, the history and, and, and mapping of African American music since their arrival. Uh -huh. um, but I also participated in, a, in the, as a hip hop specialist for the National Museum of African American Music in Nashville. So I just completed those two projects and I teach a class on youth music scenes and social movements. And it's interesting that you brought up the hashtag business because I teach three sections on uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the Me Too movement, and then Never Again. And they're very different. And they're, it's a very contemporary um, youth music scene that doesn't work in the same way that, that social movements have worked in the past. Um, Black Lives Matter as a movement has had that connection that is more familiar to us from the 1960s civil rights movements, but the Me Too movement is far more diverse. There is no real soundtrack, but if we look at every um, musical genre, there's an example that talks about these issues. Um, the Never Again movement is even smaller, but at the same time, it speaks to a lot of young people, teenagers in particular, who've been the most active in protesting and challenging um, legislators, uh, challenging city, their neighborhoods, their own parents. Mm -hmm. um, so musically, that is kind of evolving as well. Um, in, in Parkland, in, in Florida, we have the children themselves writing their own music for themselves. And then we have outsiders who have been also engaging with uh, talking about the issues. Not directly, but it's 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 present. So that's slowly happening. I'm I'm looking and anxious to see where that where that goes um, because, the, like I said, they don't tend to uh, um, consolidate in the ways they may have in movements in the past um, because they are communicating in different formats, mostly in social media. Um, but they are finding their connections through that format. So that's uh, research projects are fairly new and and, and still exploratory. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Now, what haven't I asked you about? What else should we know about you all? I think you asked us how we got into our program, or how we got into um, the things that we were doing. Yeah. Yeah, have you ever done rap yourself? I was, I actually, when, in one of the other classes, I teach two hip hop classes. Yeah. One's a large lecture with 270, uh -huh. and one's a small one with 30. And we actually do have a rap battle in that class. So we all, and sometimes they make me rap too. I'm not very good at it. 
where my, my specialties were more oh, the graffiti side and, and the dancing. So I we'll also get in the know. dance floor and we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll, I'll teach them some moves. I do it in slow motion. I mean, can't show you now, but I got my two knee pads on because age happens and <laughs> that's, a, that's a dance form for so young people. In, yeah. But I'll show, we'll get down on the floor and I'll teach them some moves and then, like I said, we'll go out and we'll do some graffiti and not out in public, but on the chalkboard. Um, so we do play with all four elements um, in that in a smaller environment classroom. So that's my experience with hip-hop. Did hip -hop. you pick this up in Cincinnati? Yeah. I um, asked us a New Yorker, but... Uh, uh, well, I had some New York connections, but... Yeah. Um, no, 79, sixth grade, um, rap music became a, na a national phenomenon. Yeah, it seemed it like it was just going to be a fad. Mm -hmm. But Sugar Hill's Rapper's Delight, every kid with their mustard knew all 14 and a half minutes of those, those, those verses mm -hmm. from beginning and to end. I was end. in Africa, and I learned all, yeah, all those verses as well. <laughs> Uh, sure did. It, it, you know, it's one of those things that you still, yeah. I, I, I can probably still recite at least half of them now. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I also didn't do that in class, just because they kind of forget that, yeah, we do, we, everyone had to do that because that's what kids did and it was mm -hmm. a trend and that's what introduced you first to the music. Mm -hmm. But then when you realize that that was a commercial product that had nothing to do with the culture, and then you also, they're connected to the dancing, connected to the, the graffiti writing, and that the, there were DJs actually involved. Because we, we had studio musicians doing that in, in the earliest days. And, yeah, so once you connect the dots and recognize the brokenness of the rapping, the brokenness of the sample of art, the brokenness of the shattered glass look of the wild style graffiti, um, the brokenness of the movements in the dance, it, it's thematically South Bronx broken neighborhood turned into a beautiful art form. And so it's progressive. But, yeah, it was introduced to me by the commercial product first. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I want to thank you all for coming, and we can continue this, but I think what we'll do is have you back in a couple of years and see where you are with your different, okay. different uh, projects. But thank you all for coming. Thank this you, Nancy. Great to talk to you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.